Oh, hi. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Scott Fitzpatrick. I'm the co-director of the Windex Festival of Moving Image. I'm just joining you here from the control room where we're live streaming from tonight. Super happy to be joining you for uh, what's kind of an exciting opportunity and in conversation with Nikki Little and Jean Frayne and Julie. We'll be talking about Jean's new solo exhibition showing at the Platform Gallery in partnership with the Windex Festival. <laughs> okay, um, ours aren't frozen, I don't think. Um, wow. This is a nice kind of Indian time right now happening. Mm. <laughs> Hi again! Wow! Technical difficulties coming to you from the war room. Really unexpected. Uh, I hope you can hear me now and see you. <laughs> we are here for an in conversation with Nikki Little and Jean Frida Julie talking about Jean's new solo exhibition. I think Oh my goodness. Okay, wow. I'm gonna wrap it up because this is the worst intro ever. And uh, the rest of the talk is not going to be this clumsy. I apologize. Uh, the Windex Festival of Moving Image is gearing up from October 7 to 11. I'm really excited to include Jean's solo show as part of our program. Um, all of our proper screenings for the Windex Festival are going to be taking place online in this space, October 7 to 11. Uh, we have a really great program. Please check it out on our website. Um, but tonight we're here to talk about Jean's show. And I just want to plug a special initiative that we have going on that Jean's part of. Windex is offering one-on-one -on -one studio visits for Manitoba-based artists to bring and discuss their work with four mentoring artists, Jeanine Frey and Julie being one of them, in addition to Leslie Supnett, Eve Tajney, and Charlene Mamboat, and uh, really looking for Manitoba folks to take uh, advantage of this opportunity. So get in touch with us at info at windex.org and set up a studio visit with Jeanine right away. The deadline to apply for those is September 28th at midnight. Um, wow, I was going to say more, but I got flustered. I don't know if you can tell. So I'm just going to hand it off to, to Nikki and Janine. Wow, woo, I love that too. Some more, some more fun, glitchy stuff. Wow. Nikki, I think you should take it away from here, and I'm going to leave you to talk. Well, thank you for the intro. I'm, I really enjoyed all of that. Those are some really good sound bits. And I'm really happy to be here and make way for having me be a part of this. Um, my name is Nikki Little and Janine. Do you want to say hi as well quickly? Yeah, Drew Lindsay. Hi, I'm Janine. Really grateful to be here. Thanks for hosting us and having us and yeah, being down to me in dialogue, Nikki. I know. I could not pass up the opportunity. As I think you know, artists out there in Manitoba, I think we should take advantage of a studio visit with Janine. I definitely would, um, but I'm slightly short on time, and I'm not making anything right now, sadly. Um, so tonight we're going to have a conversation. Feel free to ask questions. There's a chat function at the bottom of Zoom. Um, we can get to it probably likely at the end, and Janine and I will just uh, start a conversation, but I just have a couple little formality things to say, and then we can get going. So, my name is Nikki Little, as I mentioned before, Wapshke Mayangan, I'm from Northern Manitoba, and I'm actually currently in Toronto right now, and I'm the Artistic Director at Imaginative. Um, I've known Jean for quite a while, and it's been super lovely to uh, not only get to know your practice, but to get to know you as well, so I think this is just really a special night for me personally. Um, and the show is on until October 16th, and it's by appointment, so feel free, there's a lot of safety um, protocols are already in place uh, for you to go visit the work. It really is remarkable. We have a, a shot there, a part of the installation. So definitely take a take a, a look and go email call in and set yourself up with an appointment. Um, so Janine is a, a multidisciplinary artist. Your practice ranges from sound to performance, uh, textiles, images, social engagement, and feral scholarship, which I love that part. 
Um, and you're based in uh, Vancouver right now, and originally from Old Crow. And uh, welcome. That was, that's all my formality, and we can just start talking now. Okay, sweet. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm currently based in unceded Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh territories, and I've lived here for like 14 years now. I don't know, I've scoot over to Alberta, or scoot back up to Yukon for a little bit, but I've mostly been here for that breadth of the time. And um, yeah, it was good to be able to spend some time in Treaty One and visit friends and see, you know, like try to do that, do that work safely and get to, yeah, see some friends, little BBs, and then stay up until three or four in the morning and still on the show. <laughs> Well, the show, the show was incredible, and I was wondering maybe you would want to reflect a little bit about, now that you've had some time, you know, it's pretty specific type of install I can imagine in terms of just what's happening right now, but just specifically to the work and now reflections upon creating some new works um, and putting it all together. Mm, so, uh, reflections after having some space from the work? Mm -hmm. Mm. I also want to say that you do make things like you're making a festival right now. It's <laughs> you're making texts, you're making calls, you're making, you know, mm -hmm. ways. <laughs> scheming. Still always time to scheme. That's good. Mm. I mean, thank goodness for insomnia because it just never stops. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying to reflect on the show and the installing. Yeah, thinking like, what does it mean to make these large mosquito legs? And yeah, just reflecting, getting to be in gratitude a bit for the um, yeah, like those constellations of care that unfold and like help support a work into being. And as somebody who's like pretty pretty independent like it just feels really meaningful to be able to learn how to welcome more people into my practice and the video my dad helped me shoot it and he's not like a I actually want to say that I was gonna say he's not like a camera person so I can't do that you know what I mean and then I actually reminds me of and I also have to say I had this tendency to speak very like elliptically or like tangentially and I'm like that normally but I've been like, like I've been on on one so <laughs> I have to back back in. In. um but yeah, yeah thinking about the work and thinking about those relations and getting to yeah film in my home community and when um Colin and I had been in dialogue for like four years maybe longer about the show and mm -hmm. It was just pretty meaningful to get to bring it back together. And so the, in the screen here, you can see um, two long stems, uh, wooden stems on top of the... Hi, um, I'm, I'm super sorry. We're still having a technical issue with uh, some sound echo. And um, we're going to go down for five minutes and we'll be back. And after that, it's going to be on point. And I'm really, really sorry about the headache here. We'll be back right away. No worries.
Oh, wait, we're off studio mode too. I know. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, really, really sorry about that. We had a, a technical issue with our embed code on our website at the very last minute, and it really threw me for a loop. And uh, then things kind of snowballed from there. So I'm going to take this opportunity to start things from the top, and I'm going to introduce Janine Franajutli and Nikki Little to talk about Janine's new solo exhibition, Small Mounds of Flesh Form, currently on view at the Platform Gallery. So please welcome, again, properly this time, Nikki Little and Janine Frayna Julie. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Scott. You handled it well. It's great. We're back online. Um, Nick Wick for having me here. Uh, my name is Nikki Little, Wapshi Mayanga, and I'm from Garden Hill, which is in northern Manitoba, and currently based in Toronto. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited to share some space with Janine and to talk about her fantastic show. Okay. They've had the show at um, I think that was great to platform like, on until October 16th, so and you're mm. able to make yeah, an appointment really. to go see the work, which I strongly suggest you do. It's really remarkable. Spend some time in there, um, and you can just email the gallery, and they can set that up for you. Um, and so just to be in a conversation with Janine is quite mar marvelous for me because we've known each other for quite a while. Um, our, our practices of... Do you have another really Wait, your work oh my god, what now? You mm. a couple times into mm. some what shows. now, dude? And then also just see your performances. I think seeing us a live performance, a, a sound performance specifically, is really remarkable. And I hope uh, we talk about today how we pull knowledge through our bodies and how um, we connect with space. And... Because I think it's just quite remarkable. Um, so welcome. How are you today? Hey. Um, yeah, Musty, for having me. Uh, I don't know how to say good what? evening yet, but I always joke that it's morning time somewhere. Pretty <laughs> 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 sure, Janine Crane and Julie Vajri. And um, yeah, I am currently in Musqueam, Squamish, and Stable Tooth Territories in Vancouver. And I just wanted to say a uh, big shout out to Windex and Platform for having me and for coordinating all of this. And Nikki, I really appreciate your time and care and that, um, you know, we're, we're in relation to each other and that that gets to unfold and take shape and look differently over time. And I think down to hang on the internet. <laughs> And thank you, uh, Scott, for, um, yeah, all your work and prep for this conversation, in addition to the other folks at Windex and Colin. Yeah. So, as uh, this, there, you can see in the, in the top corner there, you can see some shelves and some wooden legs, if you will, uh, and sculptural elements. I was wondering if maybe you could speak a little bit to this, just what's in the image right there, this sculptural work, and then we can talk a little bit more about the rest of the installation. Oh, this work. Oh, thanks, Colin. <laughs> uh, 
In, for, so for the exhibition, Small Mounds of Flesh Form, I was thinking about, like, I kind of wanted to honor mosquitoes, and I wanted to make these giant mosquito legs and have them sitting on kind of like these archival shelves and imagining our like older mosquito ancestors in in relations and thinking about um yeah i was i to run the clip I don't I know what to do. Too. Just, don't <laughs> clip. Just don't run the clip. A few We're years ago, I was like kind of cursing mosquitoes. Right like, well, and that splitter, that audio splitter. That like rocked me. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I want to acknowledge uh, my dad's side of the family. Um, and I want to honor Systems and also the importance of the caribou, of the breed my caribou bird migrating, and that, like, if you look at a map of like, the caribou, kind of have their own traditional territory. Mm-hmm. I'm imagining, like, this is somewhat of their migration route, and then there's the uh, like Alaska, um, Alaska Canadian border here, and uh, the Gwich'in territory, like, so closely echoes. It's like this there was up here because they're. Uh, part of their territory goes up into what we call Egypt, what's up, Gwanda, Gutlit, which is the sacred place where life begins, and we don't go there. But then the Gwich'in territory is just over here, and uh, so our traditional territory is, it echoes. We were talking about echoes earlier. There was some echo earlier in the, or uh, previously in this interface. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, and then thinking about the mosquitoes' relationship with the caribou, and then getting chewed up by them in behind uh, my late uncle Grafton's cabin and yeah thinking about that those and you know we have different places where our families go and that the mosquito ancestor like the ancestors of those mosquitoes ate my ancestors too like we have a uh-huh. safe and it's such a real tangible one through blood and thinking about blood memory, thinking about my grandma, thinking about my great grandma, having that same relationship with the mosquitoes and spending time on the land, um, it just struck me in a way that I hadn't been struck before. <laughs> I don't know how to finish that sentence, sorry. Um, and uh, it made me want to, uh, yeah, just thinking about how we pay what painting the land looks like and uh, like we pay for those berries and with those tea like we pay for them with our blood sometimes uh-huh. and the main film in the exhibition is called Paying the Land for My Gifts and my dad helped me shoot it and my nephew Dean who's checking the Jubilee's dog Snoopy helped keep guard for us from bears uh-huh. Because I'm like, um, I'm exposing my back in the bush, <laughs> and like, still, and shooting like a longer performance piece. And yeah, it's, like, like <laughs> and it's a little bit wide shot too. So you're like, you're far from people. So I, you know, from any other relation that you're out there with in terms of proximity, your back is to everyone. You <laughs> can't see any visual gestures that you might need. Yeah, like you have to look dog and gun on sight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Well, when we were talking about the show earlier and sort of, you know, having great conversations, you had mentioned a story or a story from the land, really, that your dad had shared around um, mosquito ancestors. And, you know, you talked about your great grandmother, and I just thought that was really interesting, too, and sort of thinking about, you know, seeing the legs here and then also thinking about... um, mosquito ancestors and what that's like and how that tradition is also carried and how that relationship has been, you know, moved forward and that kinship there. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and there's things that I don't know, like, what to share here and what to share, like, over tea with you, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, but with me, these works, I am thinking about those mosquito ancestors, thinking about their scale, thinking about that, um, like, the longevity of that interdependent relationship. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I love, I love talking about time memorial, right? But also that, like, those, um... Yeah, those relationships are interwoven, interdependent, and wondering what that looked like when they lived at that scale. Mm-hmm. Mm. And then in in uh, round one of our conversation, <laughs> you asked about uh, what does it mean to look back on the work now, and even just like there's this flurry of making and then get, getting to see it projected and a large gorgeous space like platform is so different than like spending I mean I know it's a it's a single shop but still like hours editing right and yeah. making decisions and um because there is we shot a lot of footage so Colin and I have been Colin and I have been in conversation for I want to say four years I was looking back at her email threads and it's long <laughs> and um and getting the chance to be commissioned to make a work and you know with like the pandemic and lockdown i just wanted to be really cautious of making work in someone else's territory and i knew i wanted to film outside and it just didn't feel right to film in in vancouver where i'm living now on these unceded territories and that it's like having that relationship is so important and getting to go home and you know we shot quite a bit my uh my brother and i shot i shot with my nephew dean i made a whole other garment right Mm -hmm. but it's uh, and then we have i have footage of him uh my nephew like unraveling this garment on a boat while we're like driving on the porcupine river (laughs) oh my god uh i uh my cross cabin and we're like just picturing him being like what is happening here <laughs> like, are, like blowing in the wind like, <laughs> um but yeah just kind of waiting and trying to listen to what the work needed or what um i mean everyone's artistic practice looks different but maybe not too like you can go up there with a certain idea and in my in my home community if you're going to film if it's going to be shown elsewhere you need to fill out a land use application form. And that was cool. Well, I hadn't, um, I'd been involved in projects before, but I'd never filled out the form myself. And it felt really good to do that, even though, like, I think me a couple years ago would have been grumpy and been like, I don't need to fill this out to come on my own territory or whatever. But yeah. it's just nice to do that and just see how, um, like, our community and the folks at the Heritage Department, like, take care yeah. in that way. Mm-hmm. And I think, so those are, it's interesting sort of seeing what's in the space um, and sort of, you know, the materiality, your selection of uh, presentation style. And I think there's sort of this seeing and unseeing at the same time, or sort of this like insider, outsider, a little bit moment, just sort of knowing further, thinking further through like those moments where you have to get permission to be on the land and, and film the land and like the lengths that you go to and I think around collaboration. Um, and specifically, maybe with the with the larger projection, it goes. It's quite a meditative uh, piece. And I know you had talked about, um, you know, whether it's going to whether you're going to be in focus or not in focus. And I just thought even that there, that selection and making those that discussion was really interesting. You know, it's your it, like a body in the land. What does that mean? Like, what does sovereignty mean in that in that moment? And to not be able to see, like, I wear glasses. I can't see, I can only see this far, so I did feel like I was like, you know, in those moments where I'm like, I can I can only be this far from me, and then the haze from color field to, to body, and then back again, like, we look towards it, but we're also not getting a full picture, and I think it was an interesting dialogue around sovereignty and land and the body, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. Thank you. Land and the body, and thinking about that like refusal of having that like pristine image, and what does it mean to have like a really nice camera and then not use its full like capabilities? And that there is like, I think there can be quite a bit of like snobbery or like conversational gear that's really alienating, 
and I certainly encountered that. And I also felt like a, a person who's interested, it took me so long to be able to say that I'm interested in photography. And because it felt like really hard to get out from under the hegemony of photo conceptualism in Vancouver. And I think it's taken me a kind of roundabout way in how I work with images, like making images of performances with like a dust print. When I was using the angle grinder and the antler for, um, I've done it for two different performances. One was for uh, the exhibition that Lisa Myers curator curated. I won't be able to hear them. Um, and that piece was called Her. And then I did it another time for a piece that's called um, Through the Body, Where's the Work, Gashon Daikwa. And then Gashon Daikwa is a footnote, and at the bottom it just says, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, just working with uh, what I think Olivia Wheatung wrote about. Uh, an exhibition that I had at Art Space in Peterborough, and she writes about this idea of like making fugitive images. And uh, she, you know, like there's of course other people talk about like fugitive images and fugitivity and refusal within contemporary art practices, but that um, how to make or like author an image using the technology, using lens based technology that still feels like it's utilizing some of those strategies that are important to me in my practice. Mm-hmm. This is a performance, you know, this is a performance for the land. And, yeah. and some of my performances for the land are, are, for me, I don't, this is new for me having a work that hold my body in the frame. That's uncommon for me, especially as uh, the performance art documentation for me is usually it's sound and then like a fugitive image like dust mm-hmm. or it's print and steel and or like feathers on the ground is another instance and for this piece it's like what does it mean to like have that anticipation of that of that focus or have this being met you know in like a in an art institution and with like a great reputation and then having being met with like this this poor image or with uh, maybe uh, it could maybe feel like a lack of content or that there's I don't know I'm I wanted to using that practice or strategy of withholding was mm-hmm. important to me especially in representing my body because as an, as an indigenous and presenting person like we often haven't had control over how our images are circulated what narratives they're put into and um you know, we've had a very long relationship with photography yeah. as Indigenous peoples. And it's important to be able to, for me, it's important to um, attempt to problematize or like question what that representation looks like. And I know my land's beautiful, but maybe you don't get to see it crystal clear unless you go up there. Mm-hmm. Right? And I also feel like images of a long figure in a landscape are dangerous because of what they perpetuate and how they're used to um, uphold ideas of Canadian nationhood, which I'm not really about. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering, just a little bit off of that, like, in terms of, you know, you spoke to some of the works before and working with the grinder and antler and dust. Um, I was a little bit, so, like, it is interesting seeing this piece and then also seeing the, maybe some snippets or some teasers from your, you creating the actual wooden uh, stems and seeing the dust there. And I was a little bit surprised that I, you know, there was that trace wasn't there a little bit. And it was, you know, this is a shift into a different direction. And um, I was wondering if you could speak to a little bit maybe about the sound, because you also do, there's a sound component and a soundscape that is a part of the whole space, it's filling the space. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's, you know, starts as a low hum, there's a bit of, it sounds like you singing to the land, or mosquitoes, or this emulation a little bit. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak to, like, how you composed, composed that work. So there's also part of an interview embedded in, in the sound, which was an initially paired with the video that's sitting on the ground in the smaller gallery. Uh, but I chose to just bring the two soundscapes together 
and my friends uh, kid came to see the exhibition and she's uh, she's three and kept like covering her ears and I was like it's scary (laughs) 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 and a little shame and um I find it important to work with sound because of its disruptive capabilities and that being told that the work is like meditative, I mean I don't really know what I was expecting but I also like don't want people to feel maybe fully comfortable in there either and that sound is a way to kind of um, keep that comfort turning. I guess, or not, not, hopefully not letting it like fully land, and the sound is, part of it is the interview asking my dad about language around mosquitoes, and then also showing a little, little bit about how that no, relationship to learning knowledge can also be, it's challenging, but it's beautiful, but there's also, it's kind of, it's loaded, right? It's not always this like. Yeah, and with the choice to have the mosquito legs there without having I do. Yeah, I mean, that would have sounded great in an echo. Who knows? We could be glitching out on the other side. We don't even know. <laughs> so we're on an airplane mode. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, with the choice to have the mosquito legs, as that were, I, want, I wanted them just to be able to exist on their own without leaving the baggage of the dust. And get to sit with that as a, yeah, as a and Oh, no, I found it really interesting, too, sort of, that, you know, you walk in. Well, I like that you walked in the back door. For me, I'm sort of, like, I I feel like, I don't, you know, I think a bit backwards a little bit sometimes in some of my rationale, perhaps, and how I get to things. So I really appreciated sort of, like, the entry to the space made me feel really comfortable somehow. And then, you know, you see the mosquito legs, but then there's, they're sort of stacked on this archival. You do feel like this sort of archival or anthropological kind of like way that they're organized like it's a touch to it and then but they're devoid of body and I thought that was really like kind of like interesting like for me I just like sitting in the space and seeing that and then you go shift to the to the um projection and then sort of this body but you don't get a full like you know you don't see the full thing it's, it's a bit of a haze you don't get the you don't get the whole resolution and your access to technology and stuff um, and then also within hearing the language, and I know for me, like trying to learn language from my dad, he's a bit silly. Um, he just, I don't know, he just mumbles, and then he's like, what are you even talking about? And it's always like this banter and this playfulness, and it's a vulnerability, and I felt like I heard, you know, a little bit in there too, and I felt like this, like there is a bit of disruption and uh, attention that's there. And then to the final works too, like you sort of, it, you, know, you see the, the mosquitoes coming to something on to the left side, um, they're kind of hovering towards something. You can hear there's the, the sound of the bugs coming in. And it's like everyone has such probably a visceral experience to hearing those noise, especially on that tone. Um, and you get a little bit of it too in the soundscape. And I was wondering if you could maybe speak to um, perhaps like, you know, in the third space you have some elements, a trace of some things. Like you see not a person, but you can get a sense of a person there. There's a long, thin, perhaps um, the stinger of a mosquito, a wooden stem. And then there's a little flag tape, and I thought it was just really interesting, just those elements there said so much, and said, like, I've already been able to unpack quite a bit from that, and I was just wondering if you'd speak to maybe um, that piece there, because it was a close-up, and then you shifted it again. Mm. Oh, I feel like I have questions for you, or, like, (laughs) for you, knowing my work and, like, first curating, like, we met through the show that you did at Ace Art. 
Mm-hmm. Right, and it was that, again, not having photo documentation as serving to hold the place of the work. And I, like, dyed my, my hair, like, blue-black, and then it was the dye on the park that on the ground. And a little bit on the wall from that. Yep. And, um, like, how did it feel for you seeing the choice of how the mosquito legs are portrayed? In, on the on the shelves themselves. Yeah, I, or that move. It's, mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought it would, like it really kind of, you know, in some of the early discussions that we had talked about and sort of just thinking about body and especially, especially like maybe female identified body in the land and thinking about indigenous lands and extraction, it kind of like made me feel that sort of, you know, seeing the legs and seeing that there was a narrative there, but then it was like a disruption from its original narrative. The continuum had been interrupted, let's say, not so much disrupt, disrupted, but interrupted. And so I was... Because it is a larger you know, a more of a filling light source in the room. And so for me, I thought that was just like, I kind of got tripped up on that a a little bit, just thinking about like extraction a lot and what it, like, what has it been historically, I guess, for indigenous folks, for me personally. Um, And then, you know, I have my own journey on my indigeneity and relationship to culture and community and it's different. And so I kind of just like, yeah, I felt like I went to the deep end a little bit in my own mind, just thinking about all of those things. Cause like, you know, hearing the language and like, I try all the time to carry my own language. It's a lot of work. It takes a lot of thing. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of connection, a lot of relationship building. Um, and so for this, it felt like, you know, there's so many elements that speak to a gesture or speak to an offer or to a, like maybe reciprocity in some way around like the title of the show, um, thinking about blood memory and thinking about like, how do you offer the land? So I kind of, yeah, I just kept, it brought all of that up for me in a way, because it's such like a, you know, you have metal and then you have wood and metal, like both extracted things from, you know, I mean, like a lot of lands and then metals shifted. And then these legs are emulating something that's natural um, that's from before. And so kind of like, you know, the elements and the materials themselves kind of spoke to all of that. For me <laughs> oh, thank you so much yeah that's the one that um yeah i appreciate you sharing yeah and taking that um time and i've seen that you've been yeah like going to see the show and taking notes and stuff and i it means a lot to me Amazing. that time and that care and the work this work does feel a bit like a different it's definitely a different approach for myself, but what also, what does it mean when we make something, I mean, maybe not monumental, but choose to bring that much focus to them too. And that they're like imagined as being part of this singular body, but you don't ever see that full body, but that it's also like the female mosquitoes that bite you. Mm-hmm. And Yeah, the mosquito stinger my friend's daughter helped me place. I love that. That's so great. Yeah, my friend uh, Sandra Delaron's daughter, Shane, helped me place. I think we can see it. Yeah, on the Mm -hmm. ground there. Um, We, she came in right before the show opened and I was like, okay, where are we going to place this? And it just felt, um, I was like, this is where it was meant to be. Yeah, and then with the flagging tape there, it's definitely like a um, like a bush gallery aesthetic. <laughs> and just having it, something too that I tend to avoid in my works are like a hanging apparatus, right? Okay. So it's like the um, TV, the monitors on the ground, the cables aren't hidden, but then it kind of just draws more emphasis on the like, that other space where there's this steel shelf with the like mosquito with the giant mosquito legs mm-hmm. of pine. And it kind of, that part to me too, like I thought about, you know, if you are going to harvest on the land, like the flagging tape just kind of brought me there already, even that moment and seeing the bugs and then seeing the mosquito 
uh, stinger. It was just like, it really did bring me those like very loaded, I guess, material culture um, that some folks carry. And for me, that definitely brought that there. I was curious about maybe if you could speak to, um, oh, just one quick question. If anyone has questions, you can type it in the chat. Um, we will be taking a moment after to follow, follow up with that. Um, but I was also just wondering if you could speak to sort of um, maybe like how you work right now with your practice in terms of the gesture um, of offering and um, the weight of that, I guess. And so it's, you know, you spoke a little bit to it about like having to go, the process of going back home to film, um, you had family help you um, do the filming and such. And so like, how does it kind of, it does make me think about like, what does indigenous like give it reciprocity look like and economies of, you know, what is valued in terms of like, in terms of payment, in terms of offering um, to, to do our work and to harvest and to just even be on the land. Mm. Well, I made my dad a really nice meal on the fire after. No. <laughs> um, yeah, thinking about that, I mean, everything's an exchange, right? And there's so much that goes unseen when we talk about harvesting and I was thinking about this as a performance for the land and yeah, I'm in conversations with someone right now too about like doing a show in the Yukon and just thinking about like bringing, what does it mean to like bring something home? And that it's like, I live down South, I have access to different privileges, like living in the city and, um, what does mm, okay yeah when I was applying for when I was applying for my schooling I did my undergrad at Emily Carr it took me six years and so for those of you who are like doing your undergrad is taking some time like just be gentle with yourself it's okay it takes time I got my master's too and I took an extra year for that and I'm just like a little bit slow at stuff sometimes <laughs> um, or not slow but just take my time I, I guess um and when I was applying for schooling my nation and their application they always ask like how does this impact or like benefit old crow mm -hmm. and i wasn't raised up in my home community i was born in white horse yukon but i grew up moving around a lot and um so that question was always like really sh shaped me and reminded me I mean there's many things that reminded me of the importance of giving back and I feel like that's really embedded in like the three sides of my family and that question of like how does this benefit old crow and like going back and like working at the youth center or like helping host community gatherings or working at the school um or like part of part of that reciprocity and then thinking like if I get a commission or access it's like how does some of that um how does some of those resources go back into community mm -hmm. and i got to learn a lot from and with tanya willard when she curated me in the landmarks project and we did uh and she curated me and asked me to create this work and i made being skidoo but we got to go up to my home territory and my brother took us out hunting and my dad we had like two boatloads of people and um we we're out there and my dad looks at Tanya and it's like, what's your last name again? She says, Willard. He's like, is your dad Mike? She's like, yeah, why? <laughs> they were hanging out in their like 20s in Sequoia territory. Yeah, that's amazing. And we're like on the river together there. Yeah. Right. So having that like uh, that intergenerational reciprocal mm -hmm. exchange and over yeah, over between our two territories for these two generations that we can speak to is so impactful. And that like her practice and writing and thinking and work has hugely shaped and like in influenced me. And that, yeah, I got to like bring her out hunting in my home territory is like pretty, felt pretty incredible to get to do and share that. So thinking about these exchanges and um, yeah, that 
Yeah, I'm not sure. There's a lot more that I can say to it, but I don't know what else I will say to it. But that, uh, yeah, asking my dad and my brother to help me film this work, thinking about how, uh, when I say resources can go back into community, I mean money, like how can we get like other community members paid? Like I, you Mm -hmm. know, to like help, like, yeah, it just feels really good to be able to to do that and have when I have like opportunities come up, find ways to like bring other people in. I think that that's part of that important exchange. And um, yeah, just paying for the paying for berries with blood. Like I never thought about it like that. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wait, sometimes you can be out there for a long time. And I think, you know, it's I, I think it's interesting too that's been brought up a little bit. It's just sort of like you know, everything is quite nuanced, uh, very land specific. I think as you travel around, um, you know, whether protocol or thinking about how your relationship to land. And I really appreciated sort of that one was so personal. Um, and it did, you know, you, your family had some echo or some trace that was, you know, where you still go, where your ancestors had gone. And I really appreciated too, I think when you told, when you mentioned that, you know, mosquitoes keep the caribou running. I was just like, that also blew my mind. And I was like, that it's like, it's so true because you are out there and you don't think about it and your relationship's so different. And I think it really does shift it quite remarkably, remarkably on its head. Um, Thank you. Also just like smoking to keep the bugs away. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen quit again, but it's, uh, it's pretty real. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I've always tried smoking. It just doesn't work out for me, sadly. I don't know why. Yeah. I guess that's a good thing. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you could maybe talk to a little bit more like about the materiality that you have right now. I feel like you have such a, like a coat, you know, you're, you have a specific language that you um, work with or not work with, like a visual materiality that you have and that you carry like a little bit forward. Um, if, I wonder if you could speak to some of the things that you're working on in here. Mm. Um about my like relationship to materials or about like a visual language? I would say probably start with the visual, like there's a couple things that are moving forward in your practice I see, like in terms of whether it's um, uh, like for some reason the, the small gallery space, like n- not having a hanging, um, then just the placement of the tie just on the rope, the exposed cable, um, and just that placement, because um, it is quite minimal. And I know you spoke a little bit about sort of like, what does minimum, like, what is our relationship to minimalism, I guess, as like, it, for contemporary art, or just thinking back on art history, and then also, what does that mean, you know, f- in relation to indig- indigenous, I guess, maybe visuals, or, you know, unloading what those materials could be? Oof, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I went real heavy there. <laughs> oh, good. I'm like, I'm going to bring you guys, I'm going to pace because I, um, yeah, it's uncommon for me to sit for so long. Usually during like a talk or a conversation, I'm like moving all around. Um, yeah, and thinking about hmm, some of those choices, minimalism. Um, I mean, art is, Oh, I'm so worried about making like generalizing overarching statements about art. But um, I mean, if it's about this practice of looking and I think that for a long time and still people consume indigenous culture in a specific way, right? And I want to challenge, I want to challenge or like push up against that and challenge um, those ideas around beauty and I mean, like, of course, our material culture is beautiful. Of course, our lands are beautiful. Our people are beautiful. But I want to, um, yeah, I want to be able to disrupt that or ask people to maybe look differently or not have the same uh, expectations around how images of us or our culture are consumed. And with the work, it's about 16 minutes long and it fades from black into a blurred image. And the blurred image, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, like slowly pulls into focus and then it pulls back out of focus and back into black. And 
there's some like banning that happens with this slow gradient and like the land like slowly arrives, but doesn't quite maybe reach the screen or reach you. And the sound is not the same length of the video and they're both played on loop. So they intercept each other at different times continually and it impacts how, yeah, it like shifts how the work is read. Mm -hmm. And having that, those, that variable, um, I think is an exciting part of the work to me and pairing uh, like a looping sound with a looping image that are not in sequence is a newer move for myself and that refusing that like even the stasis of the work it's like refusing that stasis so in some ways you have um these this ground that's never arriving and then you have this sound that is um i don't know like doing its own like ellipsis around that like refusal to arrive but then you have these legs that are just they're so unavoidably there but that industrial storage shelving, like, I also wonder if, like, people just walk past it and don't realize it's a work. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't, I would say, I'm not sure. I feel like they, people gravitate. Like, when I, every time I was there, people stayed and just, and looked. I think, like, the light play, the angles, people were really interested from, I know Charlie came and she was just staring at them and she's like, what are these? <laughs> and they're so, you know, they make their own beautiful line and, um, but yeah, and I feel like because they look like like sort of organized in a way or like they're placed two per shelf, it kind of makes me want to know more and sort of like how is this how is this categorized or how is this organized or, you know, that was really interesting. I'm wondering about like intimacy and in archives because they feel they're such cold, often like they're kind of horrible spaces and the sound, like what our belongings listen to day in and day out. Oof, like that haunts me. Mm -hmm. But I also, um, oh, there's a, there's a woman at the, now the Museum of History, but formerly the Museum of Civilization, and she will play sounds for your ancestors' belongings. Oh, wow. So they can hear yeah. her and like be around their, their sounds mm -hmm. and like through the research with uh, through landmarks and through this project, I'm doing another project with my dad right now. I think it's called like rematriating sounds into Northern landscape and looking at how uh, climate change or like co colonial induced climate change is shifting sounds in Northern landscapes. And my dad and I are working on this project and we've gone to visit a few different uh, museums and spend time with ancestors belongings, both in Alaska, right? Because like the, we're a bordered people. Yeah. The border. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, on both sides of the border. And yeah, just thinking about that hum that they hear and then wondering about intimacy in the archives. And then also, um, I love that work that, insul that uh, show of Ursula Johnson's of the uh, plexiglass with the um, like with the woven baskets like mm. etched to the oh uh, yeah yeah etched into the plexiglass yeah yeah thinking about intimacy and archives and how much like Nate's I know that spend time there and they're like and then also just wondering like how many tears some of those boxes have seen. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to show an image on my phone in truly bad Zoom form. Uh, I also don't know if they'd be down with this, but um, I was part of the, I'm not with them anymore, but I was part of the Remetriate Collective for a number of years. And we just got a work remade. And this is like me hugging the new work in the archive. And I got to like spend a little bit of time alone not in their archive, but in their storage room. I got to spend a little bit of time alone in there with the new work. And um, 
you're spending time with it and it's like in its thing and you have your table and whatever. And then I'm in there alone and I realized like, it kind of felt like a, I don't even want to say the word, but just like, I just wanted to hug it. Mm-hmm. And I realized what a strange gesture it was to be doing that in an archive and to be doing that in those kind of spaces. And um, yeah, hello. Yeah, just wondering about intimacies and archives. And the first archive I spent time in was at the Darcy McNichol Center at the Newberry Library in Chicago. And it was so weird and hard to do that research, even in searching up some of the key words and that like some of the key words, like to access some older like statements or things in archives from my nation, like it's a, it's a derogatory slur. Yeah. You're viewing things through, I mean, it's just, it's so violent. Yeah. Right. But then your like ancestors are like on the other side of that. Uh, are there like in books on shelves? I found a picture of my auntie, uh, Doris <laughs> Najutli, and she had just graduated from hair school and she's this huge beehive. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. It's the archive there. And oh like that was gosh. in the fifties, like it wasn't even long, you know. Yeah. I mean remember- but sorry. Yeah, no, my friend my friend Jenny Western t- often talked about like sort of, you know, sort of the shift to labor, I guess, shift to from reserve on reserve to into urban settings. And um, specifically for Indigenous women, like hair school was like sort of, you know, you can sign, find like not PSAs, but you can find sort of government videos that were created being like going into work and going to hair school. And these women with these in, in you know, amazing quaffs and like big hair and stuff. And I think like it reminds me of Carolyn's Mobilize um, video, sort of like, you know, what is labor and how has labor shifted and specifically for like maybe gendered spaces what does that look like um and then also just labor in general from going from on reserve to or maybe in community to in more urban spaces but that's remarkable to find that in the archive I feel like yeah (laughs) when does that happen and so how is it working with your your dad if you don't mind me asking you collaborate quite often I think like your family is you know is quite you know, you can tell the value and the love and the care that that's there in the relationship. Um, I've seen a number of your works or maybe some of your talking about your work and just how kinship is brought into it and how the relationship is continues to be nourishing. And um, what is that like now moving forward with this piece or this mm. new, new research? Ah, must see. <laughs> it's like, just feels good to hear you say that. And I don't know if you'll seen in that way. Um, you know, you'd asked and lead up for our conversation to see um, an image from a collaboration that my brother and I did that was in the Our Home is Our Gallery exhibition for the ACC conference in Whitehorse, Yukon in... 2017, 18? Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I couldn't find an image. I have some, I have the work, but it was a portrait that my brother did of my dad a number of years ago. And he, or let's say 15 years ago, he gave it to me and I, it was on canvas. It was like, he had taken it off the stretcher, gave it to me. I rolled it up. I'd moved all around with it. And it was starting to get these amazing cracks all through it. Mm -hmm. And they all kind of emanated from my dad's, uh, from the painting of my dad's face, like on his, from his eye. Wow. It was like the spider web of cracks that um, like emanated from there. And I, I made an, I made a light box for it. And then I argued that my contribution to the collaboration was time Mm -hmm. (laughs) and just like moving or like living with this thing intimately. And then uh, yeah, made a light box for it. And um, it also just reminds me of, I was living at Squatchy's Lodge at the time and there was so many like Fridays or weekends that I would spend inside, like under fluorescent lights in a basement. People were like, it's nice out. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I feel like lots of artists or people who work in, I mean, do we ever really get a day off? Like that no. line is so blurry. Yeah. And right? I feel like that low hum that you spoke to, maybe that's in the archive. Like I hear it right now in my office and I'm like, I go home and there's just like, you had spoke a little bit maybe to the soundscape and like the drone of the land and how like, 
environment, like how the environment is shifting and how the sounds are shifting. And I thought that was like really, you know, when I think of up north, I do hear a motor, either like the motor of the boat or the fishing boat, or I do hear a little bit of skidoo. And there's these specific uh, cues for me. And I thought like, you know, you talking about how those are shifting is so interesting, especially when we are right now. It's like this drone, this different drone is following us or being it's just around and it like and how you maybe think and how maybe for me I've experienced some of your sound work how it moves through the body and sort of like what does that mean and moving through the archive like I'm just like what does this all mean <laughs> honestly I just get like elated like driving a skidoo or like being on a boat the sound is um yes I love it like it really alienates or freaks some people out, but mm-hmm. yeah, that, that drone and yeah, talking about how a drone is actually like, it's new tradition now. <laughs> <laughs> it is it's how it's like the soundtrack for our land, mm-hmm. it's like machinic drones. And I feel like a lot of my work is like trying to bring that sound into a gallery space and that's why I loved working with the angle grinder or with the um for the first exhibition that we worked on together the uh, dehumidifier yeah and um I'm just sorry I'm just spaced out thinking about my pog pedal <laughs> <laughs> and um I have two I have two of them now but um <laughs> sorry just here brag but <laughs> Um, that's a flex right there yeah uh I think I don't know what else to say around that I guess Mm -hmm. well we can throw it out and see if anyone has any questions from the audience reminder you can ask a question um in the chat function um but yeah I don't know (laughs) what else well it was interesting actually just maybe quickly that, you know, when you talked about the piece, I had asked about the piece with your brother that had painted, and I'm just curious about time and your relationship to maybe what you're thinking about about time right now. Um, Oh, you're so good, Nikki. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Right, and then you'd ask the question about kinship, then I just talked about that painting, and (laughs) but we were able to talk about it. Yeah. That's good. Um, Yeah, thinking about kinship and thinking about time, and I mean, time feels differently for a lot of us now with, I mean, I think it's pretty elastic. And then the relationship of time, I think it's important to ask people to sit through a 16 minute video. I mean, maybe it doesn't feel that long for art audiences, but maybe it also kind of is. Mm-hmm. And um I sent the video to someone and they were like, oh, I think you sent me the wrong file. It's just, uh, it's just two images. And they, <laughs> no, that's definitely the work. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, asking for that, that slow gaze or that there's a specific way that our like lands and bodies are consumed with like a quickness. Yeah. Like a bag of chips that like, you just like go through them, you know, and this is maybe pushing back against that a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And kinship, I think it is just about those sets of relationships and like Quill, Christy, Peters talks about our um, relational citation. And as somebody who works in like girl scholarship or in academia, their idea of like what what is the referent or who gets to be determined as being uh like acceptable referent Um, Mm and there's so many interesting conversations going on around that and this move to like to center and uphold indigenous knowledges is incredible is yeah obviously really important and Mm -hmm. centering indigenous epistemologies and it not always being in like reaction or relation to colonization and I I mean I love the term decolonial aesthetics I think it's like so much important work has been done is being done around decoloniality but I also wonder about that language and where like what it means for us in northern communities 
and that like maybe we need some of our own language too because there's like post-coloniality and I've like this isn't the first time I'm saying this either I'm not the first person to say it either but that like post-coloniality comes from a certain set of like geopolitics and place and relationship to what Walter DiMiglio calls the colonial matrix of power but those sets of relationships too and um relationship with the colonial matrix of power is different in Africa, is different in India, and it's also different in Latin America, where some of the first, where that writing around decoloniality comes from. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean when we're talking about it in in this space? What does it mean talking about it in our, like, even farther north communities? And the relationships to coloniality of power is so vastly different. And that when we're talking about decoloniality it's still centering coloniality and then we're you know I guess I feel shy because I'm not like I'm not saying anything new and I don't like (laughs) you know not that I have to but yeah just thinking about that relationship to like time and kinship and that there is like this important focus on kinship systems maybe and like uh relational citation maybe more so than uh people's bibliography or something Mm -hmm. (laughs) the trace the echo yeah Mm -hmm. well I think like how are you feeling do you have anything else that you I would say actually I do have a thing for our Windex you can um I think we had mentioned earlier but you can actually also sign up for a studio visit with Janine um through Windex please check it out it's for Manitoba artists um it's a really great opportunity as you can tell, there's so much wealth and so much knowledge and such good conversation, good things to chew on and fun things to like just sit with and let breathe. And um, I thank you so much for taking the time to spend, to chat with me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, Nikki. And um, <laughs> yeah, thanks to the folks at Windex. Thank you. It looks so rad, but I'm um, really grateful for my little uh, care package tote that was given. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. So I think that's it.